Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Seventh Rule Star Trek Convention Editions with your stars, Sirach Lofton and Aaron Eisenberg. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are joined with Sarah Gouldy, who is pretty much all over the place in Star Trek fandom. She's in groups, she's in conventions, she did an awesome panel that she's going to tell us about. I believe that was just last year. It so, was. hello, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Do you want to start off by just telling us about this uh, awesome panel you did last year? Sure. Um, Amy Imhoff, our moderator on the left there, invited me to be on the Women in Star Trek panel, um, which had mm. Marina Sirtis and Mary Chifo on the right, um, talking about women in Star Trek, both the show and in fandom. And it was a fantastic time. I should have been on that panel. I'm not sure why I wasn't asked. <laughs> just saying. Just I, how, <laughs> I have two theories. <laughs> we only need one, I think. One is enough. <laughs> one is enough. Uh, wonderful. What did, what did you guys talk about on that panel? Um, we talked a lot about um, Mary Marina's characters. Um, we talked, because Discovery was new and we had just seen that, we talked a lot about that. Discovery has a lot of feminist themes going on, which is mm -hmm. fantastic to see. Um, and yeah, it was just great being on stage which, with a bunch of female Star Trek fans talking about what the show means to us. Wow. And let's start there then. I think that's a perfect segue. What does Star Trek mean to you? Star Trek, I think, is a place where we all get to see ourselves. And for some of us, that's not something we get in other media. Mm. But I think no matter who you are, you see yourself represented somewhere in Star Trek. Like, Star Trek is the only show I remember growing up where I saw a family that looked like mine, because I'm half Japanese, and the O'Briens were mm -hmm. my representation on TV growing up. There we go. See, this is what I love hearing, yep. is what connects people to uh, to the various shows obviously you're, you're talking about ds9 uh we've had um vn who connected to voyager and janeway um tyler who connected would just before you um uh, connected to uh, the original series and and so forth everyone that comes on and and that's really interesting that you brought that up because i don't think any of us have discussed that on our show thus far uh, that we have um, an interracial couple raising a child and Japanese and, and um, white Caucasian. And that resonated with you. That's awesome. Yeah, it's something you know I don't think... A, sorry, you know that we have a Hanahate, by the way, joining us next week. So stay tuned for that, who also is uh, half Japanese, half white Caucasian. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, what was I going to say? Well, Anyways, uh, so how, how that family dynamic resonated with you and brought you into the show? Yeah, it's something I don't think I even realized when I was a kid watching it. But now that I'm an adult, you know, I really appreciate having grown up with that rep representation on TV and feeling like I was a part of things, mm. you know, and now I know Hana and she's like, you know, she's TV me. Yeah, she, she, yeah, she's wonderful. She's great. I can't wait to chat with her next week. Um, I have a question, though. This is kind of a dangerous question maybe about that. Do you think DS9 represented that dynamic well, or do you think they didn't go far enough? Woo, Ciroc, Aaron's asking the tough question out. now. Here we go, he's going right in. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really different because they're representing it in a different universe than we live in today. So they're not gonna talk about the issues of being a biracial person in society mm -hmm. the way that I'm experiencing it myself today. It's mm -hmm. showing me this is what things could be someday. Hmm. And it's interesting that that's what you gravitated, to, uh, gravitated towards uh, because we also have another interracial couple with Chase Masterson's character, Lita, and Rom, a Bajoran and a Ferengi. Um, right. So we've got a lot of different uh, themes going on on DS9. And I, I wonder, you know, one of the things... Um, Ira felt in the documentary. Did you see the documentary yet by any chance? I did. Okay. So when he says in the scene with the editor um, about um, LGBTQ uh, representation, right? I, I, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. Um, and when they got to, you know, uh, that point on the computer, he says, we didn't do that enough. We really didn't go there. We don't deserve a check mark. We don't deserve an X but we don't deserve a check mark. Yeah, he so, left a question mark. Right. Yeah. 
and 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 he was being honest and fair to himself because they didn't take that chance with Derek. They didn't they didn't really go where they knew they should have gone, and and explore that. And I was thinking to myself, and and we're just at episode ten, and how far you know they go with uh, O'Brien Keiko relationship, and and that dynamic as well as Lita and um, and Rom. So uh, so looking back on the show and what you feel you connected to. You know, do, do you think they could have done more? Do you think they did enough? Or do you think it would fit well within the show? And the fact that they just made it part of the show was, was wonderful. I actually think they did a really good job with racial representation on Deep Space Nine. Um, I mean, it was the first show with a black captain. Mm -hmm. That was important. Um, they did have biracial families. Um, they had a lot of characters of different backgrounds. So I felt like they did cover that very well. Um, I think Ira was really honest about them not covering LGBT issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to give them a little bit of leeway for that. They couldn't necessarily do what they're doing on Discovery today. Right. Um, but no, in terms of racial representation, I think they did a great job. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, one um, of the things that you said that I thought stood out for me was that you mentioned, Sarah, that you could, you saw yourself, that you were able to see yourself represented, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people gravitated towards different characters because they felt like they were able to see themselves represented or, or maybe their ideals. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's interesting to me. Yeah, you know, that's, that's how I felt when I first saw Morn. Anyway, what were you saying, uh, Sarah? <laughs> I was gonna say, um, I edited an issue of a fanzine last year called Journey Planet, and I did a whole Star Trek issue. And a big focus was having people write about how they saw themselves in Star Trek. So we had like someone on the spectrum who saw herself in Data. Wow. Or we okay. have a, a, a Black Trekkie writing about seeing Cisco and seeing Jake on screen and how important that was to her. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's a huge thing for Star Trek and why it's endured for so long because it kind of gives hope to so many people that things yeah. might not be good now, but they're going to get better. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, segue that, your, your love of Star Trek into conventions and, and Star Trek Las Vegas coming up. Um, when was your first convention and what is it about conventions that keep you wanting to keep going to them? So my first Star Trek convention was the 50th anniversary convention in 2016. Wow, not so far away, Sarah. Yeah, and I had actually waited a couple years to go. I heard about it several years earlier, but I was waiting for the 50th anniversary because I was only going to go one year and that was going to be it because mm -hmm. I thought people who fly to Vegas every year to go to a Star Trek convention are crazy. Or so <laughs> now I'm coming up on my fourth year in a row. Um, and it's, it's really the fans. Like if yeah. it was about the celebrities, I could have gone once and been satisfied. And that well, was thank you, thank you, appreciate. Thank that. you, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> I'm glad that we make such a positive <laughs> impact on on, on other. Completely people. not about you, Aaron. <laughs> that was a joke, Sarah. Absolute joking around, and 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 that's the theme we're constantly hearing: the family that that people uh, make, that they the connections that they make with all of their friends. Um, within this world of Star Trek. Yeah, it's, um, it's been wonderful. Mm. Um, it's so wonderful knowing people all over the world that you have something in common with. Mm -hmm. um, after the convention, I'm going to go to the UK for a couple of weeks and I'm going to see friends from Star Trek Las Vegas in wow. England. Um, you know, halfway across the world. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah that is. That's great. Uh, what are you looking to, uh, forward to most for this year's Star Trek Las Vegas? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, they just announced that Nana is going to perform with the Rat Pack, and I'm really oh, excited yeah. about that. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, wow. If she doesn't do Fever, I'm going to be really disappointed. If Say that again? If she doesn't do Fever, I'm going to be really disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> you give me yeah. Fever. I'm bringing my <laughs> thermometer. You better watch it. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, because Ethan Phillips was not able to make it this year, so uh, Nana is going to fill in for him with the Rat Pack, and that just sounds so cool, doesn't it? It's going to be like I, I've never seen her performing with them, and I think it's a match made in Bajor or the Wormhole or something. <laughs> or in Quark's Bar. Uh, you know what? I'm surprised they didn't ask me because every rat pack needs a Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, you know? right. I, think you're, I think you're too tall. 
I think I think I'm yeah, too tall. I think you're too tall. There are a couple tall guys there. Yeah, they're all tall. I auditioned boy, boy. And, and they haven't called me back. So yeah. <laughs> did you check your Snapchat? I did audition. What? Did you check your Snapchat? Yeah, I did. Oh. I, I, I uploaded it to Max and he hasn't gotten back to me. I think that's Sorry a that. wonderful day. I know, sure got quiet there. It was all a joke. Yeah. I'm not a mission for the Rat Pack. Uh, I'm not a singer. Uh, I, I, if I got into a tux, you know, people might be concerned. So um, so I haven't gotten into a tux. Sirach, you're lucky you're, that you can't see what's going on because as soon as like Aaron and I start talking, Sarah gets like this look on her face like, what the hell are these guys talking about? <laughs> Sarah, Sarah's going, I thought this little blurb was about me. <laughs> so anyway, no, about you, funny. Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I am just enjoying the show. You guys go right ahead. No, we're here. You know what's, you know what's funny, Sarah, when I listen to you and I hear like the stories of, of a lot of the fans that talk about you know, and the 50th, I guess, brought out a lot of people that were uh, hesitant to come to conventions. But uh, thank God for the 50th anniversary because a lot of people made new friends and, and have new experiences. But I want to say this. Um, as I hear your story, Sarah, and we've been listening to stories now from people, you know, going to conventions, it seems as though the people that are at the conventions are having more fun than the actors, <laughs> which is... the which is great, you know, because it's like the illusion is, oh, the actors, you know, they're living the celebrity life and they're having such a great time. But really, the people that are having the most fun are the guys on the other side of the aisle, you know, which is great to me. Yeah, we need to change that, Sirach. I think this year we start showing up the fans and go, oh, yeah, well, us actors are going to have a great time. And I'm going to connect with everybody afterwards. <laughs> We're all going well, to get I think we are, we are changing it, Aaron. Uh, me, you, and Ryan are changing it by – by bridging the the gap between the distance of the guys who are, are you know, there as, Absolutely. as guests and, and the people who are there to visit. So we're bridging that gap. That's yeah. a great point. But I will say that the two of you have always been pretty good about bridging that gap at your tables. Like a, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of the Star Trek actors that aren't just there for the money and that aren't just like, okay, sign this and get the fuck out of here but they're engaging, yeah. they're friendly. The two of you have always been great. People like Garrett, Anthony Montgomery yeah. is, is, yeah. Anthony yep. Montgomery Jeez. surprised me because when I first met him, we exchanged like a few words. And then like a year later, I'm passing by his table and he goes, oh, hey, Ryan, how's it going? I'm like, how the, does he remember my name after meeting 10,000 people since then? And that, that's a tribute to you guys are always really good about you know, making sure that, that everybody realizes that you appreciate them as much as we appreciate you, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm there for the, I, I'm there, I'm there for the fans. I'm there for the fans. I've never really, I don't know about you, Aaron, but I've never had somebody walk up to me and say, I really hate you and you sucked on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Not worse. I don't, I haven't had that happen yet. I've had, yeah, I haven't had that yet. No, so I mean, what I'm, and I say that to say that, you know, it's a, it is a welcoming kind of family environment, and I feel welcomed into the family. Right. And yet, and you're right, uh, Ryan, Aaron, and I are among the actors that do, uh, you know, reach out and try to make personal relationship with people and, and not look at it like a business and more look at it like an experience. Yeah. And, and for me, it is an experience. So I, I cherish the, the times outside of the conventions when I'm hanging out at the bar with, you know, somebody or we're going to a club or we're just, you know, in the lounge and we get these kind of after hour moments that are special for me, yeah. you know, yeah. personal moments. Hey, how many of you at home when Sirach just said experience twice, you got a little sad because of the Star Trek experience. I know. I, <laughs> I don't know I if you'll see anybody at home raising their hands when they're watching the show though. Um, Sarah was going to say something a few seconds ago. She, she had a comment. I was going to say, yeah, you guys, um, Aaron and Sirach, you guys are so great with fans. I met Sirach at your table like for two seconds last year and then ran into you at the Gays in Space party later. And you were like, hey, Sarah, and gave me a big hug. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Aaron, yeah. I met you at the Gaze and Space luncheon, I think, a uh -huh. couple years ago. And yeah, we've been friends ever since. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And you're friends with Melissa. She loves you. She thinks you're wonderful. And Please it was amazing that you actually got Ciroc at the table. Uh, you know, that, <laughs> right in that, in that middle thing of come back in 15 minutes and you. It was two and, minutes. She said two <laughs> minutes at the table. <laughs> I have to put in two minutes every five hours. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and we make so many connections around the world. I mean, it's, it's really a wonderful part of this show to meet so many people around the world and now stay connected to them on Facebook and on Twitter, on Instagram. And, uh, it's, and it doesn't seem to slow down, you know, with, with each new Star Trek show and people come back to watch DS9 on, on um, Netflix or Voyager. It is just turns into one big family that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the more guests we have like you, Sarah, that come on the show to, to express to us why you are a part of this world, why you're a part of this family, uh, we, we hear the same, the, same, the same stories, family, connections, friends, um, and, and uh, feeling represented and feeling part of something, part of a, a, something positive, not just part of something, but something positive. And I think that's the key word to put in there. And Sarah, I want to ask you, what would you say to the, the young girl out there, or the young you know, adult out there that says, you know, going to conventions is silly and flying to Vegas every year is, is, is an idiotic thing to do. And only crazy people do it. Yeah, what, what would you say <laughs> to that person now, having experienced what you have? Oh, I would say just go now. Don't wait for 50, 50th anniversary. Go now. It's 100% worth all the friendships you're going to make and all the relationships you're going to create and all the opportunities it's going to open up for you. Um, on that, when you went for the first time, and you were thinking you were just going to go once and see it, experience it, and move on. How did you go about making those connections? So for somebody that says, you know what, Sarah, I got you. I'm going to go. And I don't know what to do. I don't know where to begin. I don't know anybody. So what advice would you give those people that are listening to you that would, that would heed your advice? Uh, so first of all, go on Facebook. There are a couple of groups associated with the Star Trek convention. They're not official, but there's like unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas, uh, USS Rio, and a couple of others. Um, I arrived at the commission already knowing a whole bunch of people just from being in those groups. Mm. Um, so that's the number one thing. And the number two thing is go hang out at the masquerade bar every night. That's how I met Ryan. Mm -hmm. And then that's where everyone that's hangs great. out after the convention. That's where you're going to meet the people who want to meet people. Mm -hmm. That's where I met Ryan. <laughs> I met Ryan in the bathroom. He handed me some toilet paper. It was very kind of him. I'll never a urinal that. too. I don't. I don't know why I did it. I wanted. I was to tearing. My eyes were tearing, and I needed a white white toilet paper at the urinal. That's that was a good one, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but Sarah's right. Is that like we actually? What's really cool about this community? One of the many things is how much we embrace newbies. You know, like when somebody comes and it's their first year, we almost like, we, our eyes light up. We're like, oh cool, you gotta check this out and let me show you around and let me introduce you to all these people and what do you like? I can bring you there. I mean, everybody's like so excited to welcome a new member of the family, you know what I mean? And uh, I think that makes it to where when people come for their first time, they're like, why wasn't I coming to this every year? This is amazing. Everybody's so welcoming. They're more welcoming than really any other experience in the world. Like, I don't feel that welcome when I go to, into a grocery store or to the post John office. Wilkes isn't welcome that much at the Abraham Lincoln, you know, conventions. No, very funny. Um, <laughs> don't, don't ever use that joke again, Aaron. That's the last time you can use it. Or do it, whatever, see what happens. <laughs> that's the, you that's know what, the though, last I, time I want to hear that. <laughs> I go to a lot of conventions of different kinds, and really, Star Trek Las Vegas is the most welcoming. Everyone wants you to have a good time. They'll give you all kinds of tips and advice. Um, there are newbie get-togethers that are organized by fans just for the people who are there for the first time. So it's, it's a really great convention to start with, even if you've never been to any kind of convention before. Mm. No, no. One complaint I have heard is about people sometimes saying that two things that they want to do are scheduled at the same time. Mm. So maybe they want to get they want to get Shatner's autograph, but you know, um, Patrick Stewart's on stage talking or something like that. No, we're uh, on stage. Any, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So is there anything like that that you that you wish could be better? Um, not really. And honestly, that doesn't happen too much because a lot of the times when they do autograph signings, they do it in the main auditorium anyway. Yeah. So you're just standing in line while the person you want to see is on the stage. Um, really, I don't have too much trouble with things being double scheduled. Unless you're into um, some of like the science stuff and stuff that goes on in the second theater, that might be some, a bit of a problem, but I don't personally run into that very much. You know where a lot of the conflicts, the, the, the scheduling conflicts come, are the extracurriculars after. Because creation does a really good job of planning things out like that, but uh, what I think Sirach's right, that there are some definite conflicts, but they happen after the convention. Because this group wants to do a party on Saturday night, but this group's also doing something on Saturday night, and you want to do right, both, right. you know, things like that. Yeah, they yeah, just, but I've they had really that, I've had that come up with the Rat Pack. What about the Rat Pack? I've had issues with the Rat Pack performing on a night that something else was going on, and it was you had to choose either to go watch the Rat Pack or go to this other party. Watch yeah. the Rat Pack. Sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Very good. What were you saying, Aaron? You were going to say something. I don't remember now. Oh, I, I, cool. I, I guess we're off the hook. Well, uh, then final question the for you, Sarah, mm -hmm. um, before we have to go here. What is your favorite Star Trek series ever and why? Well, Deep Space Nine because O'Brien's. Mm. Right? Yeah, that, that was your connection. I do feel like we, we, we have to start the, the show saying we're going to ask you a question or when you say it, because I don't want people to think they have to say Deep Space Nine just because, you know, Sirach and I are from Deep Space Nine. They I just want to be clear. Okay. All right. And, and you know what's interesting is that now that we've watched these first 10 or 11 episodes, uh, I feel like I could have gotten more O'Brien. I feel like I'm missing the O'Brien uh, family dynamic, just like we were missing the Jake and Cisco and it's dynamic. True. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So that's, I, the, that's the third family dynamic on the show. You're right. Well, he's been yeah. absent. O'Brien's been absent for not Nagus, but the two episodes before that. And Keiko, you know, very upset with her, by the way. She, she goes to Cisco saying she wants to set up a school and then she bails, you know, by the, you know, she's gone again. She's still gone. And O'Brien has to take over and he's not a very good teacher. You Typical know? botanist. It's, well, it's a little frustrating. One thing, uh, one thing I did uh, come across while I was doing research for the show was that uh, Colum Meany had it written in his deal that he was he was able to uh, do movies and leave at will. So he probably was doing some other work somewhere else yeah, when he was miss, missing out for that long period of time. It wasn't because he was sitting at home. Yeah, I put that in my contract, too. I just didn't get any other movies during that run. But, yeah. So, Sarah, Aaron says that's an unfair question. So, how about this one? What's your least favorite Star Trek series ever? Oh, I hate answering these questions because I, I don't want to, like, jump one. on someone else's favorite, you know? Yeah. But so, you can answer it anyway. Yeah, we're not recording. <laughs> He's recording. <laughs> okay, how about this? Do you like Discovery? I love Discovery. I love it, too. I love it, too. Um, Sorok made some good critical points about it though that I can't disagree with, but I enjoy it a lot. Uh, we, we did all, Ryan's starting to post all those episodes up from our show talking about it, but I'm looking forward to season three. What are you looking tor towards to most at this moment with everything coming forward? Um, in addition to the con coming up, obviously you have the con, but you also have all these shows coming up. What are you looking Question. forward to most? Picard. Are you? Oh are Yeah. You? Yeah, so are you a big wine fan? Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big wine fan. I am a big Patrick Stewart fan. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very I think good. I think I'm I'm curious too to see what uh, they're going to put together for Picard. Yeah, same. Wow, and that's coming from the number one Discovery fan, Sirach Lofton, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that was a little sarcasm there, Sarah. <laughs> a lot of sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think Sirach has to look forward to season three of Discovery because they got rid of what he was. <laughs> critical of that's no longer um yeah 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 they, they've been they've been taking my notes they're listening closely <laughs> and uh you know i should get producer credits i could be like 23 on the list yeah. but uh <laughs> but one of the things that they're they're freeing themselves from is having to uh check all the star trek canon boxes and i think that checking those boxes cost them character development and 
and uh, s stories that could be more controversial, especially when you have all these issues going on right now that they could they could summarize into a future type of uh, tense. I don't know if I 100% agree with you on all that. Uh, and because as I, as I mentioned, as we're watching DS9, it, it ha we have what, 20? How many episodes for season one? 20 something? 20, 20? 21 or 22. Okay. 22. They've got, yeah. they've got a long arc to tell a lot of stories. So they've got a lot of chapters in that book for character development. Discovery has 16 episodes. You know, 16 to tell a story and to build character. Um, so I think yeah. they have a much bigger challenge to build character. But, but, but if you look at the stories on DS9 compared to what I've seen so far on Discovery, we are only 10 episodes into DS9 and we already have uh, very thought-provoking concepts like uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of the prophets and you have the... Uh, the idea of the trill and the past life and what it means to, you know, is the person responsible for the, the past life of, of this entity. And you have these kinds of deep, deep concepts where they're bringing up thought provoking things uh, right away. Okay. Uh, and then, and then in the, and then contrast that with, you know, uh, Spock is being set up and I don't know who's the red angel. That's not necessarily like, like a deep thought where it's like, well, oh, this is controversial. I did agree with you that they're not putting the ideas of, you know, morality, yeah. ethics too much in there. They're not, they're not making the viewers really contemplate certain things and what have you. Uh, but I also just feel like, do they have the time? What if DS9 ended in six episodes? What if we only have six episodes left for season one? I, I would feel, ooh, I feel like a little unfulfilled. We spent so much time really... You know, I don't know. Uh, it's, just, it's an interesting but, uh, dynamic, Sarah. What, 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 yeah, what the they lose in that, how I, each show is set up and how it's executed. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that? Sure. So as as Sirak and I debate this, and I know we probably Ryan's going to say we have a very few minutes left. Um, we have like negative ten, yeah. Oh, we're negative ten, so we're over our mark. So we'll end on this. Uh, Knowing DS9, knowing the seven-year arc that it has and as many episodes it has, and you also love Discovery, and Ciroc's point is valid, that it doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't ask a lot of questions. It doesn't have a lot of subtext within the character development. The character development is a little bit on the weaker side, but I argue that they only have a, such a short amount of time to tell a story. So how do you feel about that? Do you think it's a tough situation for them. They could have done more. You wanted more, but maybe not. Or I like it exactly the way it is. Um, I think you're right. They do have a shorter period of time and they're investing all of their character development in a few main characters. Like mm -hmm. Pike got more developed than characters who have been on their two seasons. So far, right. Good point. Good call. But I think Discovery, in a lot of ways, is the child of Deep Space Nine in that um, Deep Space Nine kind of pioneered doing these long arc stories, and that's what Discovery does now. Nailed it. Mm -hmm. Because Erica and Bowie are DS9 fans, and, and I, there's a lot of those elements in the show. But Ciroc's point is also very valid. Um, but I just think they don't have the – I think it's hard to fit that in the time. Yeah. Well, as a, as, a, as, a pro, as a quality of product, I still have to say – Visually, they're putting out a better quality product than what we put out. I mean, just as far as visually. It looks amazing. The set is great. The camera, they, the high definition is accurate. The, the scenes are, the, the fight scenes look great. A lot of lens flare. I like, yeah, I mean, as far as what I see, I like it. You know, I just feel like this characters could definitely, they can have more challenging, thought-provoking, controversial issues where they leave the viewer saying, oh, they just brought up an issue about, you know, something that's in the current event that's in the headlines now, and it makes me see that in a different way. I do want to point out, though, that Discovery is doing an amazing job with representation. Um, yes. If you go back and look at what Gene Roddenberry wanted for the original series that he didn't get, he wanted the crew to be half women. He wanted there to be more people of color. Um, yes. In 1991, he was telling people that he wanted to have LGBT characters on season five of Next Generation. Wow. And now yes. in Discovery, you finally have this. You have a crew that's half women. It's at least half people of color, I think. You have 
LGBT representation. Right. You have characters with uh, physical disabilities. I think they're just knocking it out of the park in terms yeah, of that aspect. Yes, yes, well done. Yes. Well said. Well said. Yes. I agree with that. That's pretty good. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say one thing that I was noticing when I was watching the Deep Space Nine, which is the difference, you know, in storytelling uh, with past Trek and current Trek is uh, with, with the old stuff, rewatching it, even like the early episodes of Deep Space Nine, which we didn't, you know, didn't think too fondly of back in the day. But upon rewatching, we see a little bit more richness is that each episode and all the stories, there's a lot of subtlety. There's a lot of subtext. There's a lot of depth. Whereas the newer storytelling, like on Discovery, it's, it's, it's a lot less subtle. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's there. It's in your face. It's on the surface. There's a lot of explosions. There's a lot of colors. Um, you know, it's different storytelling. Personally, I prefer subtlety and depth. Uh, it's more sophisticated writing, uh, personally. But uh, obviously, Discovery has a lot of its own merits as well. But it's, that's just one of the things I noticed, uh, the difference in writing styles. Hmm. Right on. Well, we look forward yeah. to season three. And Sarah, right. thank you for yeah. joining us on the show. And we'll see you in Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Las Vegas here in a few weeks. Oh, I can't wait. I can't right. wait. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, check this out. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Oh, that's awesome. a 1986 20th anniversary Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> Wow, Disneyland Hotel. Wow. Somebody gave it to me. Yeah. And then anyway, uh, thank you so very much, Sarah. Uh, for Sirach Lofton, Aaron Eisenberg, I'm Ryan T. Husk. Sarah Gouldy. You got it. Sarah Gouldy Cut, they call me. Gouldy Cut. The cousin how, of Gouldy Cut. That's how uh, <laughs> Chekhov would say it. Oh, God. Well, thank you very much. As always, remember the seventh rule. <laughs>